The following is adapted from the School of Movies podcast from mid-2015. Fury Road is fucking astonishing to experience. It's an opera. That's the absolute best way I could put it. Everything is so strongly felt and vibrantly expressed in sound and vision. Everything is so raw and primal. Miller had been out of the action game for decades and suspected at the close of each of the previous three films that he was now done for good with Mad Max. What he learned doing Babe Pig in the City and the Happy Feet Dancing Penguin films is that for every scene there is a perfect place to put the camera. This, by the way, is a joyful told you so on my part to an idiot I once went to college with who maintained that animated films weren't really films as there was no camera to speak of. Quite the opposite, in fact. From the sounds of things, it gave Miller the training he needed to go from passable mid-80s family action to one of the best shot examples of organised chaos on film. The momentum and literal driving force of proceedings is impossible not to get drawn into. It's like we've stumbled off a bridge and onto the back of this speeding truck and the best we can do is cling on for dear life. Yet what truly cements it is how much I engage with the characters. Max himself is the fourth most interesting person on screen, and even he could be described as a little bit fascinating. What I loved most about Fury Road may not have been intended. Certainly from hearing George Miller talk about it, many of the more symbolic aspects of it kind of fell into place along the way as the story was being crafted, set in place more by logic than political intent. But it was when the movie was released and decried as secret feminist propaganda that the true meta-narrative took hold. Here is a direct quote from one of these self-proclaimed, and this is a direct quote, misanthropic, hedonistic, and nihilistic. In an article he hammered out upon realizing Carly Theron was in an awful lot of the promotion of this film, and might actually at some point bark orders at Max himself. <clears throat> Men in America and around the world are going to be duped by explosions, fire tornadoes and desert raiders into seeing what is guaranteed to be nothing more than feminist propaganda, while at the same time being insulted and tricked into viewing a piece of American culture ruined and rewritten right in front of their very eyes. American culture? Let us be clear. This is the vehicle by which they are guaranteed to force a lecture on feminism down your throat. This is the Trojan horse feminists and Hollywood leftists will use to, vainly, insist on the trope women are equal to men in all things, including physique, strength, and logic. And this is the subterfuge they will use to blur the lines between masculinity and femininity, further ruining women for men and men for women. So do yourself and all men across the world a favour. Not only refuse to see the movie, but spread the word to as many men as possible. Not all of them have the keen eye we do here at ROK. And most will be taken in by fire tornadoes and explosions. Because if they sheepishly attend and Fury Road is a blockbuster, then you, me, and all the other men and real women in the world will never be able to see a real action movie ever again that doesn't contain some damn political lecture or more about feminism, SJW-ing, and socialism. Okay, so rewind to the beginning of the movie Mad Max Fury Road. Put yourself in the oversized shoes of Immortan Joe. You're having a lovely day. Your collection of pale young boys is chanting your name. Your stable of breeder sow women are imprisoned as usual with the deeply maternal ones being milked in the manner of livestock. Your rowdy gang are getting together a war party that will race to the nearest town and trade with the ruling body there, which, judging by the mayor, will be folks like Joe himself, but also likely populated with regular, weakened, desperate people in need of food, water and shelter. Nice and easy to exploit. Somehow, over time, you have looked at the positive aspects of your tyrannical rule and seen the ability they have wrought for you and your followers to just about keep paddling in this immensely hostile wilderness. You have convinced yourself that this is the way things should be because any deviation would definitely be disastrous. And it's all for you, Joe. All to entertain you and remind you of the faith 
everyone has, that you are the God King incarnate. They would kill for you. They would die for you because you have convinced them that your purpose is so just and holy that to follow it ferociously unto death makes your lackeys equally just. Then suddenly, the procession veers off the track, driven by a woman you believed knew her place, a woman who you knew was strong, but trusted to keep her eyes lowered and her defiance in check. You find your many wives have gone. She took them, snuck them right out under your nose. You're about to lose your lineage, that future you put so much stock in, where it would be your face that would retain dominance. And that terrifies you. So you give chase. Bring all your boys together, jump into your spiky death machines and charge out there to snatch these women back and put them into their rightful place again. You have the speed and the power. You can threaten and scare them. You can even harm and kill them. Though if that happens, you know you've failed and something has gone deeply wrong with the overzealous ferocity of your goblins. But ultimately, you're going to lose. You're going to lose. These women can't be caged. While some may be scared enough to just want to reverse things and go back to captivity, the group stays strong and keep their foot down on the accelerator. To add insult to injury, the wives and Furiosa meet up with a gang of mothers. These are hard-bitten bikers of the outback with grizzled, tanned skin, sniper rifles, and compassion. Having been through hardship and oppression, these detractors can't comprehend and surviving. We end up with three generations of women defying these would-be captors, refusing to be bullied and choosing the terms of engagement. And even though his name is on the title, Mad Max himself is there to assist them. This is neither his story nor his movie, and his character is improved as a result. Imperator Furiosa made the decision of what to do, where to go, how to respond and re-evaluate when things didn't go as planned. Once the initial hostilities have been put paid by the trials they go through, Max doesn't take charge or force the situation. He helps her pull back from a death charge out into the hundreds of miles of salt, merely by laying down perspective born of experience. It is Furiosa's journey to let go a little of that white-hot desire for freedom at the cost of all else, and look at what will benefit as many people as possible through cooperation. All these real-life internet lurkers had to do was ignore this movie. Talk about something else instead. As usual, they add far more strength and fame to their enemy, weakening themselves along with their pitiful arguments. Dozens of legitimate news outlets made fun of the above-mentioned article, and it has spurred more people to the theatre in hopes of seeing something progressive. They beef-wittingly place themselves in the role of the impotent pursuer, enraged at having what was perceived as theirs stolen. They could have been Max. Instead, they end up as the deluded despot, Immortan Joe, at absolute best, and in every other case, as his unnamed, emaciated, undernourished, skull-faced, blindly devoted war boys. And at the end, after almost everybody on the Fury Road is dead in an orgy of twisted metal and burning earth, Joe meets his end by having his greatest weapon forcibly removed. His horrifying mask used to strike fear into the hearts of the fearful. His jaw, the ability to speak and exercise his influence. The mask is one of anonymity and ultimately we never get to see who's behind it because the mask is more important. That is the face he wears when he interacts with the world. In effect, it replaces his own visage. So when it is ripped away, there is literally nothing underneath but meat. Inert, unthreatening, dead meat. Ultimately, he ends his life as a pitiful, pale creature in scary clothes with nobody to mourn him. In fact, when news of his death emerges to the greater population, it is a cause for celebration because he lived the life of a tyrant Remove that fear, and a tyrant is nothing. Furiosa, conversely, is surrounded by people who don't want her to die, and Max, who has previously been gruff, aggressive, and selfish, once again in his long, muddled life, finds something small and significant he can do that will make a big impact for a lot of regular people. He supports her. He donates his blood, something previously stolen from him by the goblins, but here given freely as a kindness. His ultimate act is not one of violence, but a meek act of selflessness. 
This may not actually be feminist propaganda in the intended sense of the word, but it serves as that all the same, and I mean that in the best way possible, just the same as The Babadook may not actually be a horror film in the truest sense, but it serves as one all the same. This is not preaching to the converted in the grander scale of things. People like us are going to see it in droves, but the vast majority of blockbuster audiences do not feel as strongly about this sort of thing. Let's look at the top 10 highest grossing films of last year to examine the female presence within them. So of those 10, two were very much about women, Hunger Games, Maleficent. Two gave them near equal billing to the men, Winter Soldier, Interstellar. Three contained a strong female presence in support, Hobbit, Guardians, Future Past, Amazing. One used them as background characters, Apes. And one objectified the living shit out of them in a vile manner that makes teenage boys feel that that's absolutely fine. That was the number one film. It's not saying anything new that there can be strong women in action movies. That has been there for many decades, but there's a difference between having a strong female character, which by the way doesn't mean they have to be literally strong, just the opposite of weakly written, and having a pronounced and strong female presence in the film, and having them be the ones who also affect great change. That agency, rather than mere inclusion, is the absolute key aspect here. In the same way that roughly 4% of video games feature only a female playable protagonist, the percentage in films of women who change the way the story is moving, especially within genres that feature action, is so low that this sort of depiction is absolutely essential and so very welcome to affect a change in the landscape. The squealing man-boys, or as they proudly refer to themselves in the same breath as they try to make the term social justice warrior sound negative, meninists know deep down, or as deep as they can get, that they are fighting a losing battle. Like Neanderthals flinging their own shit at the Cro-Magnons round the corner, they represent a dying world and a cultural cul-de-sac. They can be dangerous in their death throes and genuinely threatening, but anger based on fear cannot keep any group going indefinitely, least of all when what they're fighting is the very nature of re-evaluation and evolution. Trying to cling to a closed system without the slightest clue of the second law of thermodynamics, whereby that shit rots inexorably, leading to disorder and decreased complexity. So as they shout louder, their ranks dwindle as people find the strength to step away from them and just be decent, unselfish and cooperative. Now it's tempting to growl, remember me, as they die. But really the onus is on us to remember them as we move forward, so that we mark their mistaken and rigidly held beliefs and don't repeat them in our own way as we move out of the desert night and into a fine, maybe even a lovely, day. <laughs>